This review was made possible by the support of my patrons. Patrons get early access to these reviews and also get their names in the credits, as well as access to a Mr. Tardis Discord server. More details in the description. It's now the beginning of the end for the Chris Chibnall and Jodie Whittaker era, as we now arrive at Doctor Who Series 13, otherwise known as Doctor Who Flux, a six-part serialised single epic story which has the 13th Doctor, Yasmin Khan, and newcomer Dan Lewis join forces to prevent the destruction of the universe. With the production of Series 13 delayed and changed due to pandemic restrictions, remember this series started filming months before a vaccine was made available, Doctor Who fans, in particular fans of the revived series, series are in uncharted territory. Sure, Doctor Who has had longer stories before, and even the revival has dabbled in long-form storytelling, but never quite this openly or on this scale. Sure, modern fans can buy a DVD or Blu-ray of Genesis of the Daleks, which is a six-part story, but I imagine they typically watch it all in one go. With Doctor Who Flux, we're gonna have to wait week to week to see if this story lives up to its potential or sticks the landing, which might make a review of this series at least in this format difficult. So let's go into this review series with the understanding that some complaints I may have can get rectified moving forward and even vice versa, something I liked could get undercut over the next few weeks. I'll do my best to acknowledge these changes when they happen and we'll learn about the flux together. Now with that being said, let's talk about the series premiere, The Halloween Apocalypse, written by Chris Chibnall, which sees the 13th Doctor, played by Jodie Whittaker, and Yasmin Khan, played by Mandip Gill, on the tale of the warrior dog Carvanista, who has come to Earth ahead of his 7 billion strong fleet to kidnap Liverpudlian Dan Lewis, played by John Bishop on Halloween night. However, the TARDIS seems to be malfunctioning, the Doctor is receiving psychic visions, and pieces are moving across time and space to signal the arrival of the Flux, a cosmic event which threatens to wipe out all life. We've got Sontarans, Weeping Angels, a Dog Man, and even a Crystal Dude with shoulder pads. There's a lot going on, and some of the Chibnall trappings, which have been a detriment to some of his stories in the past, are very much present here, such as the needless globe hopping and the extraneously massive cast. But I think the difference between something like the Halloween Apocalypse as opposed to Spyfall or Resolution is that it's hoping to bypass all of those issues by just moving very, very, very fast. By the six minute mark, we've been to an acid planet for a breakneck action scene, we've established a new villain with their technology, the Doctor and Yaz have gone to bed together, we meet philanthropist Joseph Williamson, who teases his mysterious tunnels in 1820, before we meet Dan Lewis in 2021 at the Museum of Liverpool. Now, this structure has its issues, and we'll get there in a minute, but it feels more controlled in its chaos than usual, because it's clear that these plot elements will get returned to over the course of the series. Chris Chibnall, as a showrunner, cut his teeth on Broadchurch, an ITV crime drama spanning three seasons, starring David Tennant, Olivia Coleman, and Jodie Whittaker. So it might work out that Chibnall is more in his element with long-form storytelling here. Heck, the Halloween apocalypse ends the same way that Broadchurch episode one did, with a montage of all the major characters and their current location for a cliffhanger ending. That's not to let Chibnall off the hook for everything, however. The Joseph Williamson scene really could have just been left on the cutting room floor, as far as I can tell. I literally just laughed out loud when he appeared in the ending montage, 42 minutes after his first and only other contribution to this episode. Maybe Diane, Dan Lewis's maybe not maybe girlfriend, getting kidnapped might have also worked being removed as well, and while the couple in the research base on the Arctic Circle do wind up playing a role as Rashenda Sandow's character is revealed to be the sister of the swarm, I think the introduction of that subplot was really sloppy. We don't know who these two are, what their relationship is, what they're even doing there, what was that warning signal, there's, there's nothing here. Obviously, I think it will be revealed later, but there's literally nothing in this episode alone I should specify to gravitate to here. I felt nothing when they got disintegrated. I had no sense of intrigue when she smashed the device with the hammer, because... 
I don't even know who they are. What is going on here? No contextual clues, no inkling of a profession. Like, th yeah, give me something. Flux has an uphill battle when compared to Broadchurch and other serialized dramas as well, because most dramas start with the audience on a level playing field. Like, you know, Broadchurch were meeting these characters in this episode for the very first time. Whereas here, we are 39 seasons into a nearly 60 year TV show, the 13th season of the revival, the third season of a current era, and we already know some of the monsters and the characters disproportionately to other audience members. Also, the people of Broadchurch, the setting, were connected by a crime, kind of similar to how the cast here are connected by the Flux, however, the characters in Flux are also scattered across time and space. The citizens of Broadchurch know their neighbours and can just nip down the road for a chat. Not the case here. Serialization has worked in Doctor Who's past to tell long-form stories, obviously, but even that format will have a limit to just how much can be contained in it. Don't forget that we still have the Timeless Child and Fugitive Doctor plot threads that still need addressing, and the less said about Jack Robertson and Daniel Barton, the better. The thing about the Halloween apocalypse is that in terms of the broader story itself, there's very little character here. A lot of movement, a lot of style, a lot of moving parts, but not much to emotionally gravitate to. Annabelle Scully getting zapped away by the angel is a creepy scene, but I've no idea who she is, and I don't have a reason to care. Vinda escaping the swarm? To me, I have no more of an emotional attachment to him than the two guards who came to visit the swarm's prison. There is some attempt at narrative shorthand, but it feels really clunky and obvious. Have you tried the fridge? Why would they be in the fridge? Well, sometimes you put them in the fridge. They're in the fridge. <laughs> Amazing. Do not do anything that it asks, no matter what it asks, or how persuasive it seems. I mean, obviously, I have done my site resistance training. Speaking of the two guards, why didn't they open the scene by establishing that the younger one is learning the ropes of the job? Without that context to start with, it just sounds like the older guard is explaining something they should both already know. I'm a Chibnall apologist, and I think he gets way more flack than he deserves, but this stuff is undeniably sloppy. Like, why do characters have to actively announce what's happening when the audience, even a younger audience, can just see it for themselves? Containment chamber malfunction. Chibnall, I did not press enter to select audio navigation. Like, I can see it. Moments like this just rip me out of the episode, and it also confuses me, because the mission statement of this era is to give the show a prestige, an ITV drama polish with its direction, and its visuals, and its atmosphere, etc but it still talks down to its audience and just removes the visual storytelling. It's a frequent juxtaposition that frustrates me every time it happens. But what I will absolutely give credit for is the smaller stuff, the more personal character beats and establishing relationships, because this is where the Halloween apocalypse excels. In particular, the developing relationship between the 13th Doctor and Yaz. He's deliberately leaving traps in case he's followed. Clever and dangerous, our Calvinista. So why are you obsessed with following him? I don't know what you're talking about. I need to see a man about a dog. That's all you said. But it turns out the man is a dog and it's called Calvinista. And you won't tell me why you were so interested in him. It's quite clear that a bit of time has passed between now and Revolution of the Daleks, where companions Graham and Ryan left, and it seems that while they've had many adventures and gotten into a lot of scrapes, this relationship is straining. The 13th Doctor appears to have still not told Yaz about what she learned in The Timeless Children, and is going behind Yaz's back to track down surviving members of the Division to learn more about her past, which has brought them to the Carvinista, a Lupari officer. I even like how it's implied that the Doctor's single-minded pursuit of the Division has distracted her from the Flux's impending arrival. Why did I know about this? And who else does? This unnecessary shadiness from the Doctor, notoriously terrible at being able to hide their true intent in front of their companions, has obviously been picked up by Yaz, who clearly wants to explore time and space and have adventures, but almost seems to be resenting the fact that in order to have these experiences, she needs to do it with a companion, with a pilot, who won't let her in and hides her every waking thought. 
and the Doctor also knows full well what she's doing. One of my favourite scenes is when she briefs Yaz outside of the TARDIS when they land on the Carvanista ship, and she gish gallops Yaz with instructions and waffle about synchronising watches when she knows full well that she wasn't wearing a watch. Fine, you find Dan, and I'll confront Carvanista, meet back here. Confront him? Do you not remember how that ended up last time? Yeah, we got away. Doctor! The prison's holes that way. If you hear gunfire or explosions, get on sharpish. Right, synchronised watches. Forget that, I'm not wearing a watch. Any questions? No, see you soon. The Doctor is using the rambling mad woman as a front to get Yaz away from Carvanista so she can talk to him in private. It almost reminds me of the Seventh Doctor and Ace, and not just because of this ridiculously funny moment. That R rolling is wonderful. Release! But the difference here is not just that the 13th Doctor is less assured in herself than her 7th incarnation, but that Ace was younger and more impulsive, whereas Yaz is older and wiser, and also not as willing to roll with the punches anymore. I also loved how Dan's introduction to the show proper was through Yaz, not the Doctor. The Doctor's veteran companion saves the new one, and she's the one who gives him the TARDIS tour, which makes Dan a bit more of an outsider in this team than usual. Plus, I love this line. By the way, here's your house. What? How did that happen? Carbonista set a trap up for us, which miniaturised it. I can't live in that. It looks like the start of a fun dynamic, like the new kid in class being helped by another student, but the teacher is still this unknowable authority figure in the room. Really cool stuff. In all of time and space, you bring us here. Why? Who's she talking to? The TARDIS. What? This is alive. No idea, but they do chat. But let's talk about Dan, a character who, the angrier he gets, the more Liverpudlian he gets. You're just going around knocking on people's doors. I'm not the one going around smashing into people's houses dressed as a dog. Don't be throwing eggs at my house. I gone, come back. Where are we actually going? He gives people unauthorised tours around the Liverpool Museum because he loves the city. He wants to make people happy. He's even got a cute will they won't they romance with Diane played by Nadia Albina. He volunteers at a local food bank which reads as very in character for the region of Liverpool which is one of the most prominent areas in the whole country for food banks. He takes sweets home for trick or treaters but has nothing in the fridge for himself because he's too proud and maybe he doesn't want to show a weakness to his friends who offer him soup. Maybe he feels obligated to be the guy who keeps on smiling, the guy who is the positive presence in other people's lives. I make your punters happy. What's the point of being alive is not to make others happy. This is rather arch character writing, but I think it works here. Seeing celebrity John Bishop tone down his performative nature and his natural stage presence whilst still incorporating his own interests, like those photos on the fridge taken from his real career as a footballer in the late 80s, early 90s, and I also love how it's been a bit of a grey area since the Stephen Moffat era of just how much Earth knows about aliens and extraterrestrial life, and that a dog man can just break down his door, and you don't even need the Halloween element element for Dan's reaction to just make sense. It's Liverpool, and it's Dan, of course he'll react like that. Gaze upon my might. What is it with you lot tonight? Kneel before the might of the Lupari. You'll pay for that though, you know. That said, while the episode likely has its heart in the right place in a class consciousness sense, it's really strange that the Doctor points out how Dan has a flashy computer, but the laptop just looks like a bog standard silver laptop that could be as old as six or seven years. I'm not here to try and ascribe a backstory or a motive to Chris Chibnall, I don't know the guy, but this reads as the same school of thought as why does a homeless person have a phone, or why does someone on benefits have a flat screen TV, like levels of ignorance. Dan's laptop doesn't even have to be fancy for what the Doctor does with it, as she sonics it to hell and back for exposition, just like she did in Spyfall with O's projector. Yeah, this is a nitpick, 
but it did bug me, and it makes the food bank element of the episode feel a bit insincere in context. But anyway, we have the Carvinista, played by Craig Ells. Now, randomly, Craig Ells also played the guy who reads Dan Lewis his horoscope in the Revolution of the Daleks ending Sting, introducing John Bishop's casting. I thought that maybe this guy would be revealed to be an alien, but it turns out that that's not the case here. But you know, this casting makes sense if these two were in a filming bubble and could do a preview stinger safely for that episode. But I love everything about Carnivista. How he can look threatening, has an awesome laser halberd weapon, and an almost oriental inspired warrior outfit, from the metal plating to the tiles on his arms. But he's got a northern accent and looks adorable, and he loves his mum. Go on, shoot! Get back to your mum, tell her what a brave lad you've been. <laughs> Never talk of my mother. <sighs> that scene where Dan wakes up in the electrified cell is wonderful, as Carnivista obviously looks down on humans, or at least he pretends to look down on humans, and he has an obligation to save them from the impending flux, and he's so needlessly condescending. We're travelling away from your planet, through space, on my spaceship. I've seen a few criticisms of this episode that say that things just happen to Dan Lewis, as opposed to him being proactive, but this gives me Donna Noble vibes, where she gets snatched away on her wedding day in The Runaway Bride and has adventure thrust upon her. I think Dan in this scene, pointing out that he's obviously important and needed alive, helps to give him some agency, but his proud demeanour comes into play with him claiming on behalf of the human race that they don't want or need the Lupari's protection. But yeah, Craig Ells is so good here, and I love the Carnivista. I hope he continues to be a presence throughout the series, but I'm a bit worried that he might not find any room or time, because we've also got a lot of plot threads here, so let's just race through them now. Like I said before, the Joseph Williamson stuff probably only existed in this episode for that Liverpool transition. It reads like the opening scene of a future episode in Flux, and maybe it was just bolted onto this one as a prologue. We've got the Weeping Angel scene, which did not emotionally affect me because I've not got a clue who this Claire woman is, but it does colour me intrigued, I guess. She definitely recognised the angel, or at least knew what to do around it. But what I loved about this scene, in its own bubble, is the domesticated setting. We've not really seen that since 2007's Blink, the Weeping Angels in a relatable location, trying to fumble for door keys to your own home and can't see what you're doing because you need to lock eyes with the angel, that grounded, relatable scenario, it did wonders for this scene. I'm also assuming that there is another angel nearby, that's why the angels cover their eyes after all. I am curious how general audiences reacted to this scene, because I'm going to assume that the Weeping Angels are just so inherently iconic from the past eras that their mechanics did not need spelling out in this episode. Like, were there millions of people watching this episode who just had no idea what the Weeping Angels were, or has their rule set been absorbed through osmosis, kind of like the gremlins, I guess? We also have the Sontarans, 30 trillion light years away, preparing for war. We've got Psychic Surveyor Krager, played by Dan Starkey, warning Commander Ritshaw, played by Jonathan Watson, about the impending flux. And... I love these two. These absolute mad lads. You look old. My mission has withered me. It is true. Really? You look disgusting. Yes. Well, no point dwelling on it. Really disgusting. I can't believe Ritshaw actually stuck his tongue out like Commander Lynx in the Time Warrior. Way to commit to the bit. But yeah, I love the Sontarans already, and I'm looking forward to seeing them in action next week. Also, side note, because of this appearance, Dan Starkey is the first actor of the show's revival to play separate characters on screen during all three showrunner eras, with Dan Starkey playing three different Sontarans under Russell T. Davis, Stephen Moffat, and Chris Chibnall. What a legend. Now, this Sontaran scene is pointless to the plot, but the humour and the character on display makes it work, or at least it means I'm enjoying watching it, even if it's not really moving anything forward. Unlike these scenes with Vinda, played by Jacob Anderson, which, uh... Yeah, Chibnall's heavy-handed dialogue really serves as a detriment here. I think the delivery and the content of just the information that Vinda is reporting already hits home the fact that he is doing what he perceives to be a useless job for over 21,000 rotations on Outpost Rose. Just have the dry information 
and the aggravated sign-off. In all other respects, I conclude this report with my usual sign-off request that you all go to hell. Don't have the sardonic commentary and the aggravated sign-off. It just, it, it, there's so much telling and no showing for a scene that the audience already has no emotional attachment or context to. Like I said earlier, I felt no more attached to this guy than I did the two at the Arctic Circle outpost. It's only because I already knew that Vinda is going to appear in future episodes that I felt obliged to pay attention. But let's talk about an underrated aspect to this episode, and that's the Swarm, played by Matthew Needham when he's imprisoned, but morphs into actor Sam Sproul when he escapes. I love the silhouette he has in the dark room when he arrives to pick up his sister. The makeup job is unique and interesting to watch Sproul perform with. I like the voice and his gloating attitude when he speaks to the Doctor, how he almost tries to brush himself up against the Doctor, almost like he's getting ready to dance. It's a really fully formed physical performance here. The tease of the swarm, knowing the Doctor's strategies and their prior encounters that he can use against her is really interesting, and I look forward to seeing it play out and how it ties into the Doctor's lost memories. The disintegrating effect that's associated with the swarm as well is really creepy, like real behind the sofa stuff, as is the shot of them in that underground cave at the end where they've taken Diane. I worry that they won't get much time to shine in future episodes though, especially with the much more superficially entertaining Sontarans and the already established fan favourites, the Weeping Angels, but what I can say for now is that the MVP of this episode is Jamie Magnus Stone, the director, with cinematographer Robin Wennery. Now you can say what you want about the narrative cohesion, how this story throws a lot at the audience in a pretty haphazard way, however, I think the work of Magnus Stone, Wennery combined with editor Joel Skinner, makes it feel visually cohesive, how all of these elements feel like they belong in the same universe, in the same story. The transitions to the Doctor's mindscape, the imagery of the flux dissolving worlds, the depiction of Victorian Liverpool next to modern day Liverpool, it's wonderful. Like, this shot here where the Doctor first makes psychic contact with the Swarm, this looks like one shot, it's brilliant. That's the fourth time. I know. This is the simplest trajectory. Earth, we should be there already. What's wrong with you? Psychic connection reactivating, Doctor. I love this shot of the Doctor opening the TARDIS door and appearing on the TARDIS floor with the actual door behind her. The leaking TARDIS, the tableaus towards the end as the TARDIS attempts to outrun the flux and the last ditch effort of the vortex energy. The episode has such a wonderful feel to it. It feels like we're back to the series 11 style of clarity and energy, almost like the Ghost Monument directed by Mark Tondere. I even enjoyed the ridiculous escape sequence at the beginning, especially the Wizard of Oz homage with the Doctor and Yaz riding broomsticks in the storm, though I think having this be a Carnavista escape trap feels a bit strange considering what we learn about him later. Sagan Akinola's music is tense throughout and I love the sense of dread he invokes in the closing minute of the episode, capped off by this brilliant delivery from Joe DeWittaker with one of the coolest implementations of the opening note of the theme song to bring us to the credits. The end of the universe! I always wondered what it would feel like. And at the end of those credits, we get a lovely tribute to Julie Ankerson, a member of the Doctor Who crew who passed away on July 28th, 2021. She worked as a Foley artist in the sound department for every episode of The Revival, from Rose to The Doctor Falls. She worked on Torchwood, The Sarah Jane Adventures, Sherlock, and was a three-time Emmy nominee for her work. Often, a credit dedication like this is reserved for actors, writers, or producers, but it was touching to see a crew member who most fans might not even have heard of, get recognition for a career spanning nearly 30 years. Rest in peace, Julie Ankerson. So, the Halloween apocalypse. There wasn't much Halloween, which is a bit strange, but there was definitely an apocalypse. It did feel fresh and vibrant and interesting, especially with its cliffhanger almost feeling like the setup to a finale, as opposed to the start of a journey. I liked the villains and the creatures a lot, whilst some of the sloppy setup and the human characters left me feeling quite cold. 
I have optimism, as Chibnall might be in his element with long-form storytelling, but Doctor Who has a very long legacy at this point of episodic structure, so breaking away from that for a story with so many moving parts that also has to tie up loose ends from the last series looks set to be a tall order, no matter how you slice it. I don't envy Chris Chibnall. But I can't deny that the breakneck pace, the fun character beats, and quite frankly the heartwarming nature of Dan's character, along with the outstanding presentation, goes a long way to filling in the cracks in this premiere. But join us next time for episode 2 of Doctor Who Flux, when the Doctor, Yaz and Dan find themselves in the heart of the Crimean War. They meet Mary Seacole and find out what the Sontarans are planning in War of the Sontarans. I'll see you next time. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching my review of Doctor Who Flux The Halloween Apocalypse. First things first, if you enjoyed the review, please consider subscribing if you haven't already, and definitely hit that like button because it really, really helps me out. What were your thoughts on the episode as well? If you let me know in the comment section below, not only does it appease the almighty YouTube algorithm, but I genuinely want to know what you think. I think this could have been a divisive episode. I want to know if, like, this was your first time watching Doctor Who, what you thought of it. I'd also like to take a moment to thank my patrons who helped to keep the lights on here and whose names you should be seeing in the credits right now and i'd like to give a shout out to these particular patrons Anne newbauer matthew perry andrew dean jones andrew blewett callum baird daniel davis dylan whittaker emil bergren flabu flipmeister mk michael serrano nate harris palex raven woods the brit sniper toby loxton Zachary Taylor, aka Mario Fanboy 15, Dan Morrison, Nathaniel Holden, Samuel Brooks, Aaron Carver, Adam Gratton, Evil Dalek 79, Finley Rude, George is Lost, Ginger Animator, Jack D. Evans, Joseph Adams, Kean Hartley, Luke Jenkins, Rebecca Hill, and Samuel Whitaker. Thank you so much to all of those patrons, and if you'd like your name in the credits, if you'd like to get access to a Mr. Tardis Discord server, and also, maybe most importantly, get these reviews several days early because of YouTube Content ID BBC stuff, then please consider becoming a patron. Your support is massively appreciated. Thank you for watching my review, and I'll see you folks next time.